Welcome to Math 1325, Calculus for Business and Social Science. This is the first lecture for this course. I'm Professor Michael Bailey from Bookhaven College in Dallas, Texas. In calculus, there's really two big ideas that we're going to talk about through this semester. Uh, the first one is just about instantaneous change. How did things, how are things changing uh, in a precise moment? The other key concept of calculus is about accumulated change. And as, as each moment there's more change, as more, um, maybe more revenues coming in or more fluid is pumped into a tank, what is the result of that accumulated change um, over time? And so those are the two fundamental concepts of calculus. Each of them has their own tool. Instantaneous change uses derivatives and accumulated change uses integrals. Change. Now we've seen change before, uh, specifically in algebra, um, and we might look at a chart here. Chart, it's, it's fairly obvious from this chart that we're seeing a positive change or a growth in numbers. A negative change would be a decline in numbers. And in algebra we say that uh, the rate of change, specifically the rate of change, is equal to the slope. Remember from algebra we had um, a slope is equal to uh, the change in y values over the change in x values or the simple formula here if we used ordered pairs y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So in this graph that we're looking at the average change in the number of internet users, uh, again we take the y values um, and subtract them, or 4 million users in 1995 minus uh, 1.5 users in 1990. The years notice are our x values, and we get the average change in the number of internet users is 0.5 million internet users per year. So what this is saying is that our change is growing at 500,000 or half a million internet users each year. That's our average rate of change. We don't know if in 91 there were a lot of users or perhaps as we get to the end of this time frame um, the user change was more quickly, um, moving more quickly. But what if we did want to know uh, the change um, in internet users on a specific date, for example March 5th, 1993, right in the middle of this range of dates. Well this is where the calculus comes in and we're not going to quite get to that uh, calculating that today but in this lecture we're going to start building on how do we get there conceptually using the idea of a limit. Now a limit is really um, kind of illustrating the value of y as you approach a value of x. This is what we'll see as the notation or the formal definition uh, we write this limit, LIM, and you'll see X with an arrow towards C of F of X equals L. We say the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals L. That's how we read that equation, the limit equation. Now the concept, here I have a graph, and you can see it's, a, it's kind of a crazy graph. Um, but with limits, imagine that the lines of the graph are a road. And so you imagine you are a car on that road. And so as you are driving, what y value, that's the L, are you getting close to when you are getting close to the indicated x value, which is the value of C in the original notation? Okay. So let's look at this graph. Notice if we are driving along the curve from the left of the graph and heading toward negative 4. We are getting to the we are getting close to the y value of negative 2. So we could using the limit notation, we have the limit as x goes to negative 4 of f of x equals negative 2. In this case, uh, the limit actually equals the functional value uh, because the curve is continuous, which we'll talk about in a minute. Notice if we continue driving towards x equals negative 2, 
we are getting close to a whole, but we're not looking for the value when x equals 2, which is above, but for the value when we are near x equals negative 2. And so as we're getting closer to this, notice that our value, our limit value is 3, whereas the functional value is 5, right? So be careful here. A limit is about the value as you approach a specific value of x, not exactly when it's the same. This leads us to a concept called one-sided limits. And the idea here conceptually would be if you drive your car from a different direction. The notation here says the limit as x goes to c as x approaches c from the positive direction. And you'll notice a little plus sign after the c or after the value that x is moving toward. The limit as x goes to c from the positive direction f of x equals l. We can also do this from the negative direction. The limit as x approaches c from the negative direction of f of x equals l. And this is the limit as x approaches from the negative direction or from the left. The two examples we just looked at were both from the negative direction. So let's look at our graph again and see how this works. So notice if we drive toward x equals 1 from the right or from the positive direction, as we get near x equals 1, in this case, y equals 4. Or we could say the limit as x approaches 1 from the positive direction of f of x equals 4. But if we drive towards x equals 1 from the left or from the negative direction, notice we get, as we get near x equals 1, y equals negative 3. Or the limit as x approaches 1 from the negative direction, f of x equals negative 3. Now we can see that these, these limits, uh, both of these limits are as x goes to 1, but from different directions. They have different values. And if the one-sided limits have different values, then we say the full limit, or the limit as x just approaches 1, does not exist. Now it's important that you notice two different things. The first is that what we just talked about, the full limit exists only if both one-sided limits exist and they're equal. In this case, they're not. Also notice the notation can be confusing. The limit as x goes to 1 from the negative direction of f of x is not the same as the limit as x goes to negative 1 of f of x. So be mindful of this when you're uh, calculating the limits. Limits have a number of properties, and I'm going to just list them here for you. Um, we're going to assume that the limit of f of x equals L and the limit of g of x equals M, and these are both as x approaches C. The first one is that the limit of a constant is equal to the constant. Okay, straightforward. The second one is that the, if the fun f of x equals x, so in this case y equals x, then the limit as x goes to c of x is equal to c because y equals x. Here we have the limit of a sum. Notice we're taking the limit as x goes to c of, of adding two functions, f of x and g of x, or subtracting two functions. This equals the sum of their limits or the difference of their limits, depending upon if we're adding or subtracting. The limit of a quotient is equal to the product of, I'm sorry, the limit of a product is equal to the product of the limits. The limit of a quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits, assuming the denominator, the limit in the denominator does not equal zero. And then the limit of the nth root of a function is equal to the nth root of the limit of that function. So these are all pretty intuitive, and they all follow that same kind of intuitive rule. Now we're going to start talking about how do we actually calculate limits. And the first one we want to look at is, is a continuous function. We say a function is continuous if when you're graphing it, you can draw the graph without removing your pencil from the paper. So look at this graph on the right. 
the function is continuous at x equals negative 4. Okay? But it's discontinuous at x equals negative 2. You'll notice there's a hole there. Um, you'll notice it's also discontinuous at x equals 1. Um, there's a big jump there um, with holes on each side and then a value in the middle. And also at x equals 4. Notice that the graph um, coming from the negative direction goes to negative infinity and the graph from the positive direction at 4 goes to positive infinity. When a function is continuous at x equals c, then the limit as x approaches c is actually easy to calculate it because it's the same as the functional value at c, or we would say f of c. And we saw this before in the very first time limit that we did with this same chart. So the limit as x goes to negative 4 of f of x, we saw equaled negative 2. But notice that is the same value as f of negative 4. When x equals negative 4, y equals negative 2. We can use this rule to calculate many limits using a simpler form. Um, these limits include most trigonometry functions, most rational functions, and all polynomials. So let's look at that. <clears throat> Notice that the first function is a polynomial function. It's also the difference of two functions. So we could take the limit as x goes to 80 of 82 minus the limit as x goes to 80 of x. That follows the first two rules or the first two properties. The limit of a constant is the constant and the limit of x is equal to c. So in this case we would get 82 minus 80 or the limit would equal to 2. Notice in the second problem, problem number 20 here, we have a rational function. So we have to check and make sure that c, which in this case is negative one-third, is in the domain. The rule for rational functions, as for all fractions, is that the denominator cannot equal zero. When we plug negative one-third into the denominator, we actually get um, a negative one-third squared is one-ninth, positive. Nine times one-ninth is one, and one plus one is two, so we get two in the denominator. So the function is continuous at x equals negative three, because the denominator does not equal zero when we plug it in. And so then we can just simply plug in x equals negative three, and then we'd get the limit two over two or equal to one. Okay. When we're calculating limits for rational functions, we do this a little bit differently depending upon whether they're continuous or not. Rational functions are simply the ratio of two functions, or they're an expression that looks like a fraction or is a fraction. If the denominator does not equal zero, then we just plug in the value of c for the limit and calculate. That's what we just did on the last screen. We can also see this in problem number 19. Since when we plug in negative one-half into the denominator, it does not equal zero, we just plug in x equals negative one-half into this entire problem and we get the limit equals negative two. But when we plug in x equals c into the denominator, and this makes the denominator equal zero, we need to check to see if the numerator equals zero too, because there's two different possible answers. If the numerator does not equal zero, then the limit does not exist. Let's look at number 33. When we plug in 2 into the denominator, we get 2 minus 2, which equals 0. So then we plug it into the numerator, and we get 2 squared, which is 4, plus 6 times 2 is 12. That's 16 plus 9 is 25. So the numerator does not equal 0. We get 25 divided by 0, which is not allowed in a fraction. So the limit does not exist. So for number 33, the answer is DNE, or does not exist. However, in some cases, after we've checked the denominator, if the numerator also equals 0, then we try factoring and see if we can reduce the fraction. Notice problem 21. When we plug in 3 to the denominator, this does equal 0. When we plug in 3 to the numerator, we get 3 squared, which is 9, minus 9, which also equals 0. So in this case, we do want to factor. Notice the numerator, since it's the difference of perfect squares, factors into x plus 3 times x minus 3 
Therefore, the x minus 3s, which are common in the numerator and the denominator, cancel out. And this reduces to give us the limit as x goes to 3 of x plus 3. We now just plug that value in, and we get 6. The last kind of uh, limit we're going to look at is for something called a piecewise function. And piecewise functions have different equations depending upon the value of x. On the right of your screen, you can see that we're looking at f of x has two different formulas, one for when x is less than or equal to 1, and one for when x is greater than 1. The way that we're going to calculate uh, the limits for these types of functions is that we're going to check the one-sided limits as x approaches that um, interval mark. We're going to see if both of those one-sided limits exist and if they're equal. Remember that if the only way a full limit exists is if each one-sided limit exists and they're both equal to each other. So let's look at this problem now. As we approach x, um, as x approaches 1 from the positive direction, notice this we're going to use the second equation since we are um, approaching from the right or where x is greater than 1. We're approaching from values where the values are larger than 1. So in this case, we're going to use the limit as x approaches 1 from the positive direction of x plus 2, which is continuous, so we simply plug in the value of 1, and we get the limit equals 3. Notice as we approach from the left direction or from the negative direction, these are when x is less than um, 1. So we're going to use the first equation. When we plug that in, we get the limit as x approaches 1 from the negative, of x squared plus 1. Again, it is um, continuous at x equals 1. So we just plug in the values and we get 1 squared, which is 1, plus 1, which gives us the limit value of 2. Now, both of these limits, one-sided limits, do exist. We just calculated them both. But notice they are not the same. They are not equal. So our full limit, uh, the limit as x uh, approaches 1, does not exist. That takes us to the end of our lecture for today.